Well, the next Kathleen Kennedy self-insert picture they're calling Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny has arrived. Instead of Rey, we have Helena, and taking the spot of Luke Skywalker on the sacrifice altar is Indiana Jones. Serving as a sequel to 2008's Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, this fifth installment, directed by James Mangold and written by Jez Butterworth, John Henry Butterworth, Jonathan Cowston, and David Cope, is supposedly the final treasure hunt for Jones. Starring Harrison Ford, John Rice davies Karen Allen, Phoebe Waller-Bridge, Antonio Banderas, Toby Jones, Boyd Holbrook, Ethan Isidore, and Mads Mikkelsen. This time we're heading to 1969, with Indy and Helena Shaw, his distant goddaughter, who are trying to secure a device with world-altering potential, before the Nazi-turned-NASA scientist Jürgen Voller can rewrite the ending of World War II. How did you end up like this? I mean, resourceful, daring, beautiful, self-sufficient! <laughs> Dial of Destiny is the first in the series not to be directed by Spielberg or written by Lucas, and you can tell. Costing over $295 million, and with a marketing budget to match, Indiana Jones 5 is not only the priciest venture in the series, but one of the most expensive films ever made. And unfortunately for Disney, projections don't see the company recuperating their costs. Savage one month before its worldwide release at the Cannes Film Festival, The Dial of Destiny has had a lukewarm opening reception, to say the least. The consensus was pretty clear. Most praised Harrison Ford's performance, Mangold's direction, William's score, and the action, which I wasn't too surprised by. But there was no love lost for the lengthy runtime, CGI overload, Phoebe Waller Bridge, the depiction of Jones as a broken man, a lack of the spirituality and mysticism of the original trilogy, and the absence of the 30s and 40s setting, which is where the character belongs. So, is it as bad as the French say? Or are there some hidden gems for us to dig up? Découvrons-le. The film begins in Europe 1944, with the Allies pushing back the Nazi regime. A man in Deanna Jones is caught in a bind with the Nazis while he's on the hunt for a stolen artifact, supposedly the Lance of Longinus that delivered the fatal blow to Jesus Christ on the cross. Along for the ride is Toby Jones, playing indie sidekick Basil, a small in stature but big in heart English academic. If we thought the nuclear fridge scene in the previous film was ridiculous, Shiro. When Indy is captured and strung up to be hanged, an allied plane literally drops a bomb that kills everyone around him, destroys the building, while Indy survives without even a scratch. We're expected to believe that the detonation of a bomb that fell from the sky and landed a few feet from Indy freed him from a noose while annihilating everyone else. Bullshit. Meanwhile, an astrophysicist by the name of Jürgen Voller discloses that while the Nazi's lance is a dud, he's managed to unearth a piece of Archimedes' dial, a gizmo designed by the great Archimedes himself, which is capable of finding cracks in the fabric of time. After a quick slip from Nazi clutches and a ruckus on a train loaded with stolen antiques, Jones figures out the spears are fake, grabs the dial and his friend, and hightails it out of there before making a daring exit off a collapsing bridge. The film hits us with a nostalgia wave right from the beginning, with the World War II era action sequence featuring a digitally de-aged indie squaring off against Nazis. It's an explosive indie style romp with chases, explosions, and a train top brawl to boot, though indie survival often hinges on the stupidity of his enemies, who make the worst decision when facing off against him. This ranges from choosing to attack him by hand when he's holding the spear instead of shooting him, to simply ignoring the fact that his disguise had bullet holes until the plot requires him to notice it. Fast forward to 1969, Jones is estranged from his wife Marion after their son Mutt was killed in the Vietnam War. Once a celebrated academic, we're told that he's facing retirement at Hunter College. We find Jones being rattled awake in his Manhattan flat by Beatles' loving neighbor, celebrating the Apollo 11 lunar touchdown. After an ambush retirement party at the university and a stint at a bar to drown the blues, Jones bumps into Helena Shaw, daughter of old pal Basil Shaw and an archaeology student herself. 
His goddaughter basically reintroduces the ancient Dal from Indy's war-era adventure, thrusting him back into a race against Vola, who now poses as part of the American space program. This dial, a relic from the time of Archimedes, could basically enable its possessor to jump across time when its two halves are united. Physics. Turns out, Basil went off the deep end trying to crack the dial's mystery, making his daughter resent Indy. And despite a promise being made to destroy the dial, Jones hasn't managed to fulfill it. The reunion kicks off a chase for the dial's fragments, starting in a university storeroom where they meet Vola, sporting a new identity as a NASA man, as well as his CIA-backed buddies. Literally abandoning Jones for dead, Helena takes off with the dial, hoping to sell it on the black market. Here I need to point out that Helena literally leaves Jones, her godfather, to die at least three times. The writers still want us to like her, so they invent a new history and backstory of Jones abandoning her to justify her actions through exposition, which is still unmerited. I'm not joking here, the writers really want us to like her, but she goes out of her way to put our main character, an 80-year-old man, and her godfather in harm's way. What is this? Luckily, due to plot requirements and the benefits of CGI, Jones makes a quick getaway on horseback before seeking the refuge of his old friend Sala. The shootout has basically made Jones a suspect in the murders that Voller and his crew had committed, ramping up the pressure. Here the film unwinds into a string of high-octane chases and skirmishes interspersed with rather implausible plot contrivances. Director James Mangold, stepping into Spielberg's shoes, sustains a relentless pace, delivering a memorable early sequence with Indy charging through a subway and a police horse, foes hot on his heels. But he's not Spielberg, and especially not Steven in his prime during the 80s when he made the original trilogy. The films were a melting pot of classic touchstones, lovingly pilfered and skillfully repackaged for a new generation. It was a nostalgic nod to the things that defined the childhood of baby boomers, from the cheap thrills of 30s and 40s Saturday morning serials, the grandiose gravitas of past Oscar winners, to the magnetic allure of pulp magazines. Lucas, alongside Ford and Spielberg in the director's chair, managed to shift through the rubble of the past, taking the gold and leaving the dust. What They Forged was a cinematic artifact that defied classification. It was a heady concoction of the old and new, a nostalgic tribute that pushed the boundaries of what action-adventure films could be. The Indiana Jones team managed to excavate the treasures of the past and, like skilled jewelers, recut them into a gem that sparkled with modern brilliance. But Dial of Destiny isn't sifting through the past of the same influences that inspired these filmmakers, it's sifting through the corpse of Lucasfilm. Unfortunately, the Dial part gets flown to Tangier to be auctioned off at a bar by Helena, and Jones, having bumped into Helena's sidekick, Teddy Kuma, basically short round, ends up in another fight with Vola's crew. Although Vola is temporarily detained by Mason, he eventually snatches a helicopter and sets a course for the Mediterranean Sea. Jones, in a rare moment of clarity, tries to convince Helena that selling such a powerful and potentially catastrophic artifact is a no-go. Indy may now grumble about aching bones and waning endurance, but the man still scrambles up cliffs and wields his trademark bullwhip. And so, they set off to Greece, where they rendezvous with Ronaldo, a diving expert and old mate of Jones, played by Antonio Banderas, who's as charming as ever. Waller Bridges Helena is a bit of a puzzle, fiercely smart, adventurous, yet also a mercenary with an act for deception. Her pairing with Indy is an odd one. She also doesn't have that many likeable qualities. She's abrasive, egotistical, narcissistic, and very quick to mock Indy, his age and his life's work, from his sacrifices, the people he'd saved throughout the series, including thousands of kids, while at the same time wanting us to believe that Indy and Basil had inspired her. You stole it. Then you stole it. And then I stole it. It's called capitalism. She's a very selfish criminal with no honor, integrity, or even friends, yet thinks she's in the right to denigrate an 80-year-old veteran. It's just infuriating, because the script never acknowledges that she's in the wrong to think this way. While we're forced to buy, due to the exposition, that Indy is at a low point, this is because his son died and his wife left him, when he dedicated his entire life to helping others and preserving humanity's history. Not because he didn't care about anyone but himself, or because he did it for the fun, like Helena implies. Here, we're given more insight into the death of Mutt in the Vietnam War. The worst part is that we're told he went out of spite, not to make his parents proud, causing the rift between him and Marion that led to their separation. 
Their plan is to essentially fish out a tablet from the Aegean Sea that would guide them to the second part of the dial, but Vola proves to be a thorn in their side again, offing Ronaldo and tailing them to Sicily. He manages to snatch the second piece of the dial from Archimedes' grave, capturing Jones and unveils his grand plan to zap back to 1939, assassinate Hitler and replace him, hoping to turn the tide of the war. In a ridiculous turn of events, Helena manages to stow away on Vola's plane, while Teddy, who has no flight experience, chases them in another plane. Come on, don't bullshit me. With Indy in his clutches, wounded and seemingly on his last leg, Vola and his Nazi companions board a bomber, decked out in their Third Reich regalia. Something then catches Indy's eye. Vola's wristwatch, identical to the one found on Archimedes' remains, which were discovered in a tomb adorned with carvings of a bird with propellers. With that, he has an epiphany. Vola has basically included continental drift in his time travel calculations, which is a concept unknown to Archimedes when he crafted the dial. This means that the bomber is off course, on a one-way trip to the wrong era, a realization that comes too late to abort the mission. Of course, continental drift doesn't affect them in the air. Plus, the believed movement is thought to be an inch per year, so they would have been in the vicinity of where they needed to be. As Teddy pilots a stolen aircraft in pursuit of the Nazi plane, they both get sucked into the time fissure vortex and tossed back in time. As if things couldn't get more contrived, with the riders realizing how insane and unrealistic it was for a kid with no flight experience to safely control an airplane, the original pilot wakes up, apparently having slept through the whole ordeal, and begins to panic as both planes tumble out of the vortex. As it turns out, Indy was spot on. Vola's coordinates are way off, and instead of landing in 1939, they find themselves smack dab in the middle of the siege of Syracuse between 2013 and 2012 BC. It is a sight to behold, with Roman soldiers besieging Syracuse, which is protected by the genius of Archimedes' engineering. The view is doubly surprising because Archimedes, played by Nassim Amasia, is still in the process of building the Antikythera. Unfortunately for Vola, his dream of altering history crumbles, leaving him in despair. The bomber, now mistaken for a dragon by the ancients, also begins to sustain damage from a barrage of catapults. A fight then ensues in the plummeting plane, with Helena besting Vola with a well-placed shot, because she's perfect, before she and Indy make their daring escape using the last parachute. Instead of moving away from the war, the Nazis fly low on the ground and begin shooting Roman soldiers that have no idea what's going on, like us. As a result, the Romans fire back with arrows and ballistas, somehow crashing the bomber into the shore and killing everyone on board. The aftermath is explored by Archimedes and his men, who stumble upon Vola's charred remains and the intact Antikythera amid the wreckage. Archimedes then takes Vola's watch, a piece of technology from a time yet to come, implying this was used to help him create the dial. The sight of the crashed Nazi bomber had basically inspired the dragon with propellers engraved on Archimedes' future tomb, meaning Indy was always destined to go back in time in order to ensure the past was secure. The only problem is, he has no agency in this film like he did in the past. He's a backseat hostage forced into the major events, kind of like Harrison Ford. After Indy and Helena manage a crash landing and untangle themselves from their parachute, we see a grizzled, broken Indy bleeding from his gunshot wound. Unfortunately, although the other plane with Teddy lands nearby, the vortex threatens to close at any minute. The subsequent encounter between Indy, Helena and Archimedes has Jones revealing his intent to stay behind, to actually live the history he's only been able to study so far. Foreseeing the catastrophic impact this might have in the future, Helena begs him to hop on the plane to avoid any more time paradoxes. Instead of allowing Indy to make this decision for himself, the writers thought it would be great for her to then knock her godfather out cold, because everyone loves their childhood hero being humiliated. They don't even give the now elderly Jones the dignity to choose his own fate. The first time in my life I'm pissed off! When Indy wakes up, he finds himself back in his apartment in New York City, wounds bandaged. A familiar sight, the Archimedes dial lies nearby. There's also Helena, who, much to our surprise, didn't sell the Antikythera after all, showing a change in her ways. But here's the kicker, Marion, Indy's estranged wife, steps into the picture, grocery bags in hand. Teddy, Salar and his grandchildren then leave for some ice cream, leaving Indy and Marion alone for a heartfelt reunion. The final shot pans out of Indy's apartment, showcasing the city with his iconic fedora pinned to a clothesline. Indy's hand then darts out, snatching the hat as the classic theme plays in the credits roll. The only problem is that the writers forgot he's still wanted for murder, not to mention the fact that Helena got multiple people murdered, including Indy's friends, because she wanted to sell something on the black market. Sorry. Helena! Captain Jones. The film fills caught between two worlds, trying to respect the legacy while making fun of it at the same time. The result is a movie that offers nostalgia without the heart, 
adventure without the excitement and character interactions that lack the natural camaraderie of the originals. It's an unfortunate addition to the franchise, one that stands as a testament to the dangers of resurrecting the past without the necessary care or creativity. While Ford remains as unyielding as ever, the film itself sprawls across the map with a rather uneven narrative. The film struggles to find a consistent tone, swinging between a nod to nostalgia and an adventurous matinee romp with a broken principal character and bumbling obstacles in his and Helena's way. While some parts lean into the self-aware irony, other parts are completely oblivious. Indy and Helena go head-to-head -head with creepy crawlies, perform daring acrobatics, deep-sea dives, and navigate dark caves. However, the script feels like a jumbled collage of elements from past films. Dial of Destiny doesn't have the same purpose or throughline as the original series, and the final act especially spirals into the realm of absurdity. As I've said, the true north of this film is Ford's performance as a beloved Indy. Despite being written as a faltering, grim, and broken old man, even in the weaker scenes, Ford has the conviction and dry wit that only he could pull off. Phoebe Waller-Bridge gives it a role, but her character Helena has been written with the depth of a kiddie pool, and the actress has the charisma and range of granite. I couldn't help but keep wondering why they didn't get Shia LaBeouf to play Mutt again instead. Unfortunately, Helena's young companion Teddy also lacks the sparkle and charm of Kei Hu Kwan's short round from Temple of Doom, who should have also been in this film instead. It's like they traded two sun figures of Indy, people he was mentoring, helping them become better, with a goddaughter that hates him. Even the fantastic Mads Mikkelsen, who's amazing in pretty much everything else, was squandered on a stereotypical villain role, sporting in logic so flawed it's laughable. From getting knocked out repeatedly, being incompetent, to losing every step of the way, he's an underwhelming villain and foil to Helena, who, let's face it, is the real protagonist here. It's just hard to believe that Vola thought he could usurp Hitler and do a better job when he fumbles every step of the way in this film. The world building is non-existent. We have broken time travel mechanics, characters not behaving like normal people, scenes laboring on for longer than they should, inconsistent editing, things happening to facilitate the next action sequence, and despite the technical prowess of director James Mangold, Spielberg's absence is keenly felt. It's all bullshit! All of it! Mangold, though competent, lacks Spielberg's intuitive sense of visual dynamism and his knack for transferring it onto the big screen. The script has also replaced the religious mysticism with cold scientific concepts of time travel that don't belong in a 40s-inspired adventure serial. Ultimately, this film comes off as a slightly desperate attempt to keep the franchise's intellectual property alive. Jones got a fitting send-off in The Last Crusade with his father, and at least Crystal Skull allowed him to keep his dignity. But with the franchise under new management, our aging hero is once again drafted into service, this time by the greedy raiders of lost IPs. After re-watching the first three films, and even the fourth one which had aliens, I was really disappointed in the treatment of the legacy character here. Not only does the movie make fun of Indy and his age, but the writers have given his character no arc. He's forced into his resolution as Helena makes the decisions for him, it's weird to me that this was made by Mangold, who dealt with similar themes of age and family in Logan with its titular character. Logan was given a poignant, heart-rendering but empowering send-off, giving him the dignity that Hugh Jackman's tenure deserved. I saw Dial of Destiny on opening day to a theatre that was only 30% full, and while there was an occasional laugh here and there, the screening was littered with audible groans, and some even walking out before the final act, a luxury I wish I had. Beneath Dial of Density is a salvageable film, one where Indiana is the protagonist. But this film isn't about Indy, it's about Helena going on a redemption arc and dragging her godfather along with her for the ride, who, understandably, wanted to stay in the past where he belonged. Of course, Dial of Density doesn't exist to pay homage, it's a disjointed mess here to exploit our memory of Indiana Jones. It's not fan service, it's franchise servicing. It's your film. Your flight attendants are Susan and Lance. We're here to make your trip as comfortable as possible. Excuse me. Don't disturb my friend. He's dead tired. Well, that's all for today, folks. A huge thanks to everyone that requested we explore Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. And if there's anything else you'd like for me to cover, please don't hesitate to ask. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by. I miss waking up every morning wondering what wonderful adventure the new day will bring to us. Those days have come and gone. Why are they